Okay. All right, well, it's 8 a.m. and it is April Fool's Day, but no April Fool's. We're gonna have a wonderful Grand Rounds today by our own Dr. Claire O'Connor. And to introduce Claire, we have Dr. Vince Crines, our Division Chief of Endocrinology. All right, Vince. Good morning. Am I, is my audio? You're good. All right, excellent. So I'm delighted to be able to introduce today's uh, medical grand round speaker, Dr. Claire O'Connor. So uh, Dr. O'Connor is currently a clinical assistant professor with us here in the Department of Medicine and in the Division of Endocrinology. Uh, let's just say the Division of Endocrinology, it's too long. Um, so uh, Dr. O'Connor received her MPH and medical degrees here from the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. And she was, as a medical student, elected into Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society. She then stayed on here to do her residency in internal medicine. And after completing that, went to Northwestern for her fellowship in endocrinology. I think I might have nudged her a little bit in that direction. Uh, during that time, she was really very much involved in education and uh, um, participated in their clinical scholars program. Um, she also got a teaching certificate um, during her internal medicine residency. So she's been very active in medical education. Um, also, um, she's part of our uh, diabetes technology task force, um, which will be relevant to her presentation today. Um, she's also been very engaged in um, food, fasting, fitness with our medical students. And she is a fantastic physician who's beloved by her patients. So today she's gonna to be telling us uh, about a topic that I'm sure you all wanna hear about, advances in diabetes technology um, and how they uh, impact uh, clinical practice. So Claire, uh, take it, you can, it's all yours. Great, thank you for the nice introduction, Dr. Krangs. And um, just make sure I can advance my slides here. So uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk to you about advances in diabetes technology. It's a topic near and dear to my heart and both the exciting benefits and the frustrating challenges of incorporating this technology into our clinical practice. So I don't have any disclosures and to go over the learning objectives. So um, we're gonna be summarizing the benefits seen with continuous glucose monitoring, or I'm gonna be referring to this as CGM systems going forward and hybrid closed loop insulin pump systems. And that will take sort of the, the bulk of the talk. Um, and then, you know, the other objectives I'd like to cover are listing the challenges that make diabetes technology integration difficult in a clinical setting, identifying potential solutions for incorporating the diabetes technology into the clinical setting. And one thing I just wanted to, to, to put out there is I'm really focusing on an outpatient discussion today. The, you know, talk, there's could be a whole nother discussion on inpatient diabetes technology. So that could be a talk by, in and by itself. So just again, to kind of go over the outline, we'll spend time talking about sort of what I think are the two most important new diabetes technologies right now, which are continuous glucose monitoring systems and then hybrid closed loop pump systems. Then we'll move on to challenges to incorporating the technology into practice, disparities that I've noted can come from diabetes technology and some possible solutions. So starting with CGM, I wanted to set the stage by getting your attention with what seems like a, you know, a pretty difficult di diabetes clinical situation that was basically you know, resolved by using a CGM. So I sort of wanted to introduce this idea that CGM can be basically a treatment in and of itself. So this was a 61 year old lady that has type two diabetes. She presented to see me due to an A1C rising from basically 8% to 14%. And she had admitted to some dietary indiscretion during the pandemic, uh, like many of us. When you know, we looked into her data, she was checking her glucose a few times a week, ranging anywhere from the high 100s to the 400s. And she reported weight loss, a little bit of weight loss, uh, but normal bicarb, anion gap, no other sort of dramatic presentation that made me think something else was going on. 
she um, was just on metformin and glipizide when I first met her. So, you know, given her A1C of 14 and her glucose is up to the 400s, I had, you know, initially at our first visit, discussed at least adding some basal insulin to her regimen. We really focused on a lot of dietary changes that she could make. And we also brought up this idea of considering a self-pay CGM system. So I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but her insurance, given that she's just on metformin and glipizide, would probably not cover a CGM system, but um, they are available for sort of people to pay out of pocket if they choose. So in follow-up, she, you know, on return, told me she never actually started the insulin I prescribed. She did get the, the CGM system and noted that with that and improved dietary choices and meal planning, that she had significant improvement in her glucose levels and never, never needed or ended up starting the insulin. So over time, the glipizide was discontinued and we switched to a GLP-1 agonist in addition to the metformin. And her most recent A1C is 6.6. .6. Um, and I, I bring this up because she really, her feedback to me was that CGM was her main treatment for diabetes because it gave such good feedback on the impact of foods on her glucoses. Um, she could really see what was happening with her glucose, glucoses throughout the day, which was something she didn't see in the past. Uh, so, um, I will show you her data a little bit later once I kind of tell you about how to look at the data and, um, just to kind of show how, how nice it looks. So that was just sort of the opening case. I did want to take one step back and just remind you, I think this is not new knowledge to anyone, but you know, this is a 42 factors that affect blood glucose. And just as a reminder that managing diabetes is complicated and, um, the patient, a patient with diabetes, which the literature abbreviates PWD, just so I'll have that throughout, makes many decisions through the day and night about their treatment decisions. And, um, you know, almost over a third of patients don't meet their individualized glycemic targets. And you can see that it's looking at these factors, the arrows don't even go in the same direction for each factor. So depending on what type of food, what type of exercise, you can see glucose is going in different directions. So pretty challenging to navigate for patients and providers alike. And if you, if you step back even farther, only 23% of people meet targets for glycemic control, their blood pressure, LDL cholesterol, and not smoking. So I think there's a lot of work that could be done to improve glycemic control. And I'm hoping to convey to you that some of the diabetes technology can really help meet some of these targets and help people have better quality with their lives. So to give a little more background on CGM, so as everyone knows, the historical way we've been checking glucose has been with blood glucose monitoring, now, now abbreviated in the literature as BGM, and that has a lot of drawbacks. So it's painful, it's costly, it's burdensome, really only gives you a snapshot in time. So CGM systems have been around since the late 90s. Um, just a reminder of how they work, you have a glucose sensor with a little catheter that sits in the interstitial fluid, and that is measuring glucoses every five minutes continuously throughout the day. And um, as a reminder, there's about a five minute lag between the capillary blood glucose. So just to keep in mind, if, if you're kind of counseling patients on comparing the two. And there's a transmitter that either sits on top of the sensor or in some, some brands, it's actually built into the sensor. And that's what transmits the data to a, a receiver. So the receiver these days is usually a smartphone or um, an insulin pump, but there also could be like a handheld receiver patients can get. And that's where they can view the data. So I think the key advancement is that not only does it provide a glucose reading, but it provides a trend arrow. So patients can help make real-time management decisions. Um, so not only can they see their data throughout the day, but you know, the trend arrows can give them a lot of information. So this is a summary of some of the main brands of uh, sensors. So Libre, Dexcom, and Medtronic you're seeing in this table. And they, the trend arrows look a little bit different depending on the brand, but they're all kind of saying the same thing where you know, depending on the direction of the arrow or how many arrows, you can see how fast you're rising or falling with your glucoses. Or if it's sideways, you know, that's telling you that your glucoses are very stable. So if you, you can imagine if someone has a glucose of 100, 
it would be very different management strategies if it was a side arrow and everything was stable, they wouldn't have to do any intervention versus if there was a rapidly falling trend arrow, they might need to take intervention to avoid having a low. The other thing I'll kind of mention, and I'll tell you more in the next slide, is the accuracy has been improving over time where a lot of these devices, you don't have to calibrate anymore with a finger stick. So that's really helpful for patients. And as I've alluded to, a lot of, you know, the CGM systems are essential, an essential component for these hybrid closed loop pumps that I'll talk about. All of the brands that are covered by insurance now also have alerts for highs and lows. So these can be customized except for the, you know, lows, which you can't turn off, but patients can also sort of fine tune the alerts to be alerted more or less if they want. So this is looking at accuracy of these devices. And I, I bring this up because, you know, I think it shows a little bit why the technology has been initially a little bit slow to embrace for patients and insurers alike. Um, as I mentioned, it's been around since the late 90s. The key thing here is we look at accuracy by looking at MARD, which is the mean absolute relative difference. The summary is that lower is better. And the MARD for checking with a finger stick is about 5 to 10%, which is shown in that shaded pink area on the chart. You'll see in the y-axis, the MARD in percentages, and then the x-axis is the time um, in terms of years. So you can see back in 2011, these devices were not, not nearly as accurate as a finger stick. Um, so patients would have to uh, calibrate or double check with a finger stick before they would make any insulin dosing decisions. But that since you know, maybe 2015 onward, the accuracy of these devices has gotten much better into the same general range as a finger stick. So I think that explains somewhat how insurance and patients are more willing to sort of accept these technologies to replace a finger stick blood glucose check. And Dexcom G7 is the one of the newer models. It's not quite available yet, but they're reporting a MARD of 8.7%. So the accuracy of just ten, kind of to show is continuing to get better. The other thing that's improved, I think, is there's more standardized reports across all the different sensor brands. CGM brands. So I would encourage anyone that's using these devices to, um, to always start with the report called Ambulatory Glucose Profile, which is called AGP. I think of this as the endocrinologist EKG, uh, just so that we can compete with the cardiologists for um, our own reports that we can analyze. But the way that I would suggest looking at this is first understanding the metrics and what the problem is. So I just wanna walk through this report really quickly with you just so you can kind of understand how I would look at it. But first you can see the average glucose, uh, 221 for this patient. And this is sort of the same idea as an estimated A1C depending on you know, the amount of time you're looking at. But you can see that this report tells you so much more than an A1C could tell you. So it tells you how often the patient's below 70. The goal is less than 4% in terms of the guidelines and what the metrics would want. Um, so this person's doing okay with hypoglycemia, but you can see that when you're looking at the target range, so that's how often they're between 70 and 180, the goal is to be in that range over 70% of the time. They're only there about 25% of the time. So that's clearly an area you're going to want to circle back to. The coefficient of variation, I think, is um, something that I pay a lot of attention to, and I would encourage you to as well, but it's sort of this idea of variability and includes a standard deviation in the metric. So this has been shown to correlate with hypoglycemia and some, some research looking that it could correlate with microvascular complications. And the goal is to be lower. Lower is better, as you might expect, so less than 36%. So this person's doing okay um, in terms of variability. I usually explain this to patients as sort of the yo-yo effect. So if you're going up and down and up and down throughout the day, but your average glucose is 150, I would argue that um, the blood vessels and nerves don't like that and you're more at risk for having hypoglycemia and sort of chasing your glucoses. Then I would always look at how much data you have. So you wanna make sure that you have ideally 14 days and that the patient's wearing their device at least 70% of the time so you can kind of make sense of the trends. So after you look at the metrics, you kind of understand what the problem is. 
then I would encourage you to look at where the problem is. And that's what this graph shows you. So on the y-axis, you're looking at glucose. The x-axis is looking at time over a 24 hour period that they kind of plot the whole month or whatever amount of data you're looking at. Uh, and then you can see the orange line is the median of glucose throughout the day. The blue shaded area is the 25 and 75% interquartile range. Um, and then you're seeing in the shaded or the sort of diagonal shaded gray is that time and range of 70 to 180 that the, that's where you want the patient to be living most of the time. So you can pretty clearly see with this patient, they're hyperglycemic overnight. They come down a little bit in the morning and then they're kind of climbing back up again in the afternoon and evening. So that would be sort of those are the areas you'd want to address. And then you can look further down at the daily tracings and you can see sort of quickly that some of the glucose excursions really seem to be postprandial because they really jump up um, on the tracings. So potentially for this patient, you would maybe address timing of their insulin um, bolus. Maybe they need a little more with each meal and then potentially might need a little more basal insulin if it looks like they're sort of globally hyperglycemic at times. Okay, so I just wanted to follow that up with um, the beautiful data from my case I introduced to you. And I think most endocrinologists would say this is the this is the dream to see. Um, but this patient that I, you know, that you see GM as her treatment basically is in range, you know, 97% of the time, her average glucose is 119. Um, the predicted A1C is 6.2. And just looking at the graph, you can see she falls in that time and range almost all the time. So this is this is the goal of what we'd love to see. So what are the benefits of CGM? And I will show you just some brief data of where, where, these, where they've shown these benefits to come from. But we know that CGM can reduce time spent in hypoglycemia, time spent in hyperglycemia. It can reduce the A1C, although I have a little caveat with that. It improves quality of life and uh, flexibility and decreases diabetes distress for patients. And it reduces that glycemic variability. So I did just want to summarize the meta-analysis that looks at all these different randomized controlled trials of the metrics that I've just described. So this first one is looking at time and range. And um, so we'll note that the right side of the vertical black line is favoring CGM uh, to the left favors control. One thing I just wanted to mention is uh, some of these studies go back to 2008. And if you recall from my accuracy slide, the devices were not particularly accurate in 2008 um, and early, you know, subsequent years. So take that for what it's worth, but you can clearly see that time and range is favored with a CGM. This is looking at the A1C. So I think you'll see the A1C effect is less impressive. So you see more of the studies crossing the zero line. It still is favoring CGM. I, I would just kind of, again, I think you'll hopefully take away from this talk that we're learning the average glucose is not the whole story and that you really need to take the other metrics into account when you're looking at the data. Um, for example, a lot of times we will uncover uh, undiagnosed hypoglycemia that patients didn't even know that they were dealing with and when, they, when they get put on a CGM, especially like in the overnight hours, we tend to over basalize people. So if you correct the hypoglycemia, the average glucose might actually come up a little bit, but I would argue that that is still a good, a good thing to reduce hypoglycemia. And then this is looking at time below range. The top panel A is looking at type one diabetes patients. So you can see this time it's to the left is favoring the CGM. And I included the B panel because this is including a type two diabetes population, which also has shown to reduce time below range as well for that population. So who should use a CGM? I mean, I would argue, and I hope that it continues to expand to really anyone with diabetes that wants to use a CGM and is engaged should be able to use a CGM. Right now though, um, there's, you know, insurance is really paying for it for people uh, with type one diabetes and um, also with type two diabetes on in intensive insulin regimens. So basically people on multiple daily injections of insulin or using an insulin pump. And I would especially argue any one of these patients with hypoglycemia, um, hypoglycemia on awareness in particular. And then we often have been using it a lot with pregnant women with type one and type two diabetes on intensive insulin, although the FDA uh, hasn't fully given its like approval, um, but it's pretty commonly used. 
I wanted to show this graph because I'm still a little surprised at how few patients are on CGM in general. And especially given that the American Diabetes Association has recommended really any patient on intensive insulin should be offered CGM as standard of care. So this is looking at type one diabetes exchange registry data. So it was over 20,000 people, uh, pediatric and adult that have type one diabetes that are followed over time. And you can see that from 2011 to 2018, it increases significantly from you know, 6% to 38%. But even in 2018, only 38% of patients are using a CGM. I think some of the lower rates are probably due to the, all the insurance barriers and the criteria that you needed in the past to get these devices. So even a few years ago, insurers were requiring like three to four finger sticks a day sending in data for 30 to 90 days to prove that they were checking enough. And fortunately, most insurers have relaxed that criteria. So I have found in my clinic, it's much easier to get CGM covered um, for patients that meet the criteria. So it's a little bit of a busy graph, but again, I just kind of wanted to highlight again, the CGM is a treatment almost. So the way to look at this is the A1C is on the Y axis. And then the x-axis is broken into age groups. So you have the under 13 group, the 13 to less than 26 group in the middle, and then a greater than or equal to 26 years on the right. And you can see that the highest A1C is in people that are just on injections only using finger sticks, um, and that's in the black boxes. And then when you add in a pump, you know it goes down a little bit, and that's the horizontal stripe boxes. But you can see for at least the pediatric and the adults, the biggest drop in A1C is when you add in a CGM and that's the white boxes. The adolescent young adult age group, not quite as impressive, which as many of you know, if you treat that age group for diabetes, it's a, it's a tough age to engage with. Um, so, and then when you add in the pump with a CGM, which is the diagonal stripes, you can see um, a little improvement, but not nearly as much as when you add in a CGM. I wanted to also highlight this uh, expanded use of CGM because I think a lot of people are trying to show that this technology can really benefit patients that are not on full insulin regimens. And this study was looking at, um, it was a randomized controlled trial, used a pretty diverse population with type two diabetes. They were just on basal insulin. So they were not on any mealtime insulin. They could be on other non-insulin medications for their diabetes. And they divided in, into a CGM group and a, just a group that was doing finger stick blood glucose monitoring. Both groups I just wanted to mention had this sort of optimized care where they were having really frequent check-ins every couple months at least uh, with in-person or phone visits where they would use data, whatever data they had to adjust the, the treatment regimen. The other thing to mention, this was a primary care group. So none of these patients were followed in endocrinology. So the study provider would give um, recommendations to their PCP to then implement. So you can see that the CGM group baseline was an A1C of 9.1% and that improved to eight at eight months. The blood glucose monitoring group had an A1C of nine, which also improved um, to 8.4%. So there was a significant change with the A1C in the CGM group. It was only, you know, minus 0.4%. Percent, but that was significant. But when you look at the time and range, um, you, you also see a pretty significant improvement with the CGM group was in range almost 60% of the time versus only 43% of the time for the blood glucose monitoring group. And I think the other thing I just wanted to point out is this also shows that having pretty frequent check-ins with patients, whether or not they're using CGM also seems to improve glycemic targets. So just something to kind of, I'll come back to. I wanted to briefly just mention UW numbers in case people were curious, and I kind of to make an argument that we need more help with streamline, streamlining this technology into our UW clinics. This is just some roughly pulled numbers from Epic um, of active CGM orders, so take it with a grain of salt, but you can see from 2019 to 2021, the numbers are really going up in terms of active orders in Epic. 2022 included, not to confuse you, but it's really just data from January of 2022. So you can see if you extrapolate that, we're already on track to be much higher for 2022 with our CGM orders. And then who's prescribing these? So 
uh, in the blue bars is endocrine. We're leading the way as I would hope and expect at least right now in terms of CGM orders. Then you have health ed in the green, which I think is diabetes education or that type of um, provider. And then the red is other, which I'm assuming is mostly primary care, internal medicine, family medicine. So you can see that um, the other, other departments are really picking up in terms of prescribing CGM, which I'll come back to. I wanted to sort of end this topic on uh, one more case that maybe you're not as familiar with how we sometimes can use a CGM, again, for helping patients uh, improve their glycemic targets. So this is a 71 year old man. He's had diabetes for over 20 years and he's come in for a routine checkup. He's on Glargine insulin. He's on Repaglinide with meals, which is sort of like a shorter acting sulfonylurea and then metformin. So he's checking his glucose once daily. You know, he's, he's consistent with that. He is only checking it in the morning though. And he's telling you that his glucoses are always between 100 and 120. So that's at goal. But his latest A1C is 9.3%. So that's an average glucose of 220. So why is there such a discrepancy with his data? So to help look into this further, we have um, diagnostic CGM. So sort of CGMs that the endocrine clinic can put on someone for just like a week at a time. They're either blinded or unblinded. Um, in this case, I think his was blinded, but he was asked to fill out a food diary and record like when he was taking his medications. And then he comes back into the clinic to talk with our um, nutritionist and provider to sort of see what changes need to be made. So, you know, the CGM shows the problem immediately. So he's not lying when he checks in the morning, he's, he's usually between 100 and 120, but then it's the rest of the day that's the problem, right? So um, one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite people, Dr. Grazia Lepo is a sort of a renowned diabetologist at Northwestern says checking glucose is once daily is like watching the first five minutes of a movie. And I use that quote all the time now with patients, but it's really true. So you're just getting this little snapshot in time if you're checking once a day. So when you look down at the bottom panel, you can see his daily tracing where he's plotted his food diary entries here. So um, you can see that his meals, and when you kind of ask him further, it's really these high carb meals and uh, sugar beverages that are spiking his glucoses. So I think this is a prime example of where you could use sort of motivational interviewing techniques or really get the patient engaged to have the light bulb go on, you know, where he's realizing what, what needs to change um, and asking him like, oh, I see this meal, you didn't spike with your glucoses, but this meal you did, I wonder what the difference was. So you kind of can get curious with the patient. Okay, so moving on to hybrid closed loop pump systems. Pumps have been around for a while. I just like, I just find this history a little bit interesting, but the 1960s Arnold Kaddish, I learned is the person who designed this first closed loop pump system. Doesn't look particularly practical, but um, he did it. Didn't really, didn't really get much um, momentum with, with adapting to, to the times. And then up to 1974, you have this computer algorithm uh, loop pump system. It's called the Biostatter. And fast forward then to 1978, this was one of the first commercial pumps called the Auto Syringe or nicknamed the Big Blue Brick. And that's compared just for size comparison next to one of the Medtronic pumps, which is now, you know, these days this is sort of an older Medtronic pump model. So just to show you where things have come from. So I wanted to focus my attention on what's FDA approved for the most advanced pumps that we have right now in the market in the US. Um, there's a lot of different versions of pumps out there, but I'm focusing sort of on these uh, hybrid closed loop pump systems It's sort of the terms that they're called. So there's three that are approved in the US. There's a tandem pump with Control IQ, and that is a software uh, that has their algorithm in it. And this pairs with the Dexcom G6 CGM. There's a Medtronic, they have 670 and 770G models. Um, and these, this pairs with their own Medtronic sensor. And then there's an Omnipad 5. And this is the newest one that just was approved by the FDA in 2022. It's not quite available to the public yet. And this will pair with the Dexcom G6. And one thing I just wanted to mention, so you know, people with diabetes were frustrated by the slow process for these automated insulin 
pump systems. And so it, it led to this movement where people did sort of a DIY closed looping where they made these algorithms and they're available open source online under this Night Scout uh, platform. And you know, there's a whole movement where hashtag we are not waiting. So a patient, there's been a lot of patient advocacy in the type one diabetes population to make progress on this and sort of like take, take um, ownership when it wasn't happening in the industry or when it was slower to, to be approved in the industry. So uh, what do these systems do and what don't they do? I think there's a little bit of confusion outside of the endocrine world, understandably, because a lot of things have been changing quickly over time. So I just wanted to spend a few minutes talking about like wh what these pumps are doing and what they aren't. So they aren't, uh, they aren't acting like a, a pancreas, but I think they do have some definite advantages from prior systems. So like any pump, they're only infusing short acting insulin. So there's no long acting insulin in the pump. It's a continuous infusion. So the basal rate is sort of given in units per hour that you can adjust up and down throughout the day. And that's how the basal form of insulin is given on the pump. The CGM system is an essential component of these pumps so that the um, algorithm can basically use the CGM data coming into it to automatically suspend the pump when it's gonna predict a low is happening and then automatically increases and decreases the basal rates based on the glucose and the trend arrows and how much insulin is on board. Um, and then some of the pumps have a way to do auto corrections for hyperglycemia as well. So the FDA has also been allowing tighter glycemic control targets, which has been helpful to get tighter control for patients that want it. Um, so now they're down to close to 110, whereas before they were closer to 120 on the older um, automated insulin de delivery system pumps. And then most of these systems have some various ways to, depending on the brand, to go into sort of an activity mode where it, it knows to back off the threshold or targets for glucose to something like 150 if, if the patient is indicating they're exercising or sort of sleep features where it's, you know, kind of under, tells the pump that the patient is sleeping and then shouldn't be as aggressive. So just to kind of give you a little more background on what's going on and what we see when we look at reports, um, just first, I guess the, the CGM tracing is that green and yellow line on the top. So you're looking at the y-axis on the glucose and then the x-axis again is sort of time. This is like throughout a 24 hour period that we're looking at the tracing for right now. So you can see on the bottom here, these blue bars are the basal insulin and the pump is automatically adjusting that up and down every five minutes, depending on the glucose trends. Um, so you can see at times it's going up if the glucose is going up, at times it's actually suspending it if, if it senses the glucose is going down too quickly. And then I think the key thing to know and people maybe don't quite understand is these pumps are not designed to cover carb intake. So patients still have to tell the pump, hey, I'm eating 50 grams of carbs and time their bolus correctly to get the best benefit from these pumps. So you can see this patient is entering grams of carbs throughout the day. The pump does the math to kind of come up with what dose it should give based on the settings that we set and then um, gives a bolus of insulin that's reflected there. And then in some systems, it like the tandem, it will automatically give a correction dose for a high glucose, which is reflected in those little like teardrop um, boxes there. So the patient's not doing anything in those situations that are automatically giving the patient correction. And then I wanted to just because this is the newest um, system on the market that just got approved, I wanted to just spend a minute telling you about the Omnipod five system. So this is the 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 newest thing about this system, this is the only tubeless insulin pump. So you can see the middle um, pod there is where the insulin comes from and it has the built-in algorithm into the pod. So the patient puts the pod anywhere you would put an insulin pump or you know, on the subcutaneous, in subcutaneous tissue and you change that out every few days. It communicates with a sensor that's shown on the right. And then that goes to the receiver, which is like a handheld little device that the patient can use to, to monitor and bolus from. Um, the other thing about the system, it's only 
FDA approved system that the patient will be able to use a phone app, so their own phone if they choose, to actually dose their insulin. So it's kind of exciting and scary, um, but it is approved now for patients to basically dose their insulin from their phone app. So this is a um, trial. This is just looking at three months on the system, look for safety and outcomes basically, but they had both pediatric and adults in this trial. They were looking for severe hypoglycemia or DKA, and then they were looking for change in A1C and time and range. So um, one thing I wanted to just point out was this is not, this was not a very diverse uh, population. It was mostly white, white participants. The other thing I wanted to note was these patients had very good control at baseline before they started this trial. So the A1C in the pediatric population was like 7.6%. In adults, it was 7.1%. So I would say that's pretty good uh, baseline control. And almost everyone was already on a CGM before they did this trial. And most people had also been on a pump before they tried the system. So sort of like a well-controlled group at baseline that they included. So I think the takeaway is that these devices are very safe, that um, there was very minimal severe hypoglycemia. So they got 4.8 events per 100 person years. And when they compared that to that type one diabetes exchange registry data group, uh, that, that was 25 um, events per 100 person years, so much lower on, these, on the system. And that's also reflected in the actual hypoglycemia rates they saw. As I mentioned in the CGM review, we want less than 4% of the time patients to be under 70. And for kids, they were there about 1.5%, adults were about 1%, so well below the threshold. And then for DKA, they also saw very rare DKA events on the system. So 1.2 events per 100 person years, and that's compared to 10.8 in the general type one diabetes population. The A1C results, I think this is like a theme for this, talk, but um, not quite as impressive, but I think I kind of mentioned that the baseline control in this group was really good, but even in three months, they did still see a reduction of 0.7% in kids and 0.4% reduction in A1C in adults. When they actually stratified it based on patients that started with a higher A1C, so patients that started with an A1C over eight, you see more drop in the A1C, so more improvement as you would expect. And then looking at time and range, um, the, so again, this is trying to show in the graph here, the top panel is children, the bottom panel is adults. I tried to highlight the goal time and range with that blue um, outline. So 70 to 180 is the goal to be in most of the time. So even in three months, they did see an increase of 15% for kids and an increase of about 9% for adults. And then I wanted to just um, give you an example of a common scenario, <clears throat> common scenario that I've seen in my clinic on what these systems can do for people. And um, again, they're not a magic solution for diabetes and you have to have the right patient that's engaged and uh, has time to devote to learning the technology and being on it safely, but um, it can really make a big improvement in someone's life. So it's a sort of an example case of what I've seen. But um, this was a 38 year old man with type one diabetes. When I first met him, he was on insulin injections and just using finger sticks to monitor glucoses. As you can see from his data from my first visit, he had a lot of variability. So um, on discussion, he was not really proactively dosing his mealtime carb intake. And so he was sort of chasing glucoses up and down throughout the day and understandably very frustrated with his um, highs and lows that he was noting. When you looked at the regimen, I noted he was fairly over basalized. So he was getting much higher lantus doses versus his short acting insulin than I would expect for like a normal carb diet. Um, he was checking glucoses at, you know, at least three to four times a day. And if you just looked at his A1C, his, A1, you know, his average glucose was 161. So, you know, if you weren't looking at more metrics than that, you would say, you know, keep up the good work. Um, but clearly this is not um, going that well when you're looking at his data. So we first started a CGM system for him and then started on a hybrid closed loop 
pump system. And you know, his, his main comment, which I think is pretty common from what I'm hearing is, I don't have to think about diabetes as often. So I think it, you know, it, it kind of relieves some of that mental burden from that earlier slide where people are making, you know, daily, frequent daily and nightly decisions on their management. Uh, and when you look at his data, his average glucose actually didn't change really. It was, you know, it was 161 and now it's 159. Um, but when you look at the other metrics that I'm trying to argue are very important, uh, his time and range is now close to 70%, which is the goal. He's not having any hypoglycemia less than 70. And um, when you look at the breakdown of his basal to bolus, which is in this bottom panel here in the yellow and the blue on the bottom, um, he's using much less total daily insulin amounts and the distribution is much more what I would expect where he's having about 40% basal and 60% bolus. And that's what these systems are telling us is that we're probably over basalizing most people and really sort of a breakdown would be more like 40% basal insulin, 60% bolus for most people that are on a normal carb diet. So I'd like to shift now for the last part of the talk to talking about challenges to incorporating technology into our clinical practice, again, focusing on outpatient setting and maybe some solutions that we've been working on with our diabetes technology task force. So hopefully I've convinced you that we have some pretty amazing advances in technology and management, especially in these last years, but we're not as adaptive to implementing them into the clinic given the infrastructure to use the technologies is not sufficient. So I'm just gonna outline some of the barriers that I've come up with along with some of my colleagues and uh, task force uh, on what needs, I think needs to be overcome. And focusing mostly on CGM, but I think this could apply to pumps as well, but um, I'm using CGM, especially because I know primary care, this is something they're trying to implement a lot in their practice as well. So I think the first is getting access to the technology is somewhat difficult. So it depends on the insurance, patients having access to a provider that knows enough about these devices to give options. And I think it's more challenging now as populations that are shown to benefit from these devices are getting more coverage with insurance. So we don't really have a process to streamline getting these devices to patients. And as many of you, anyone that's tried to prescribe these knows, the process can be really confusing. So depending on the insurance, it either goes through durable medical equipment or pharmacy benefit, and it varies insurance to insurance. There's not really a streamlined process to navigate that currently. So it ends up being frustrating for the patient and provider alike and takes a lot of clinical staff time to navigate. The other thing, you know, I'll mention like for Medicaid in particular, their guidelines have been relaxed, but um, they still basically say an endocrinologist has to be the one prescribing it, which to me doesn't make a lot of sense, um, seeing that primary care sees most of type two diabetes patients. And then, you know, if patients are outside of Madison or have barriers to seeing a, a healthcare specialist that might have knowledge about these devices, you know, I think there could be some disparity seen there. Second would be sort of the staff and training on how to manage the technology and then helping the patient with education and setup, linking them to the clinic. Um, so the other thing to note that I'll talk about is different devices have different platforms. So you have to sort of have a clinic login or have the ability to have the patient link the device cloud to the clinic um, platform so that you can get the data easily. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, you can sort of fine tune the alerts on these different devices. So patients often need a little guidance on how to set those up as well. And then accessing the data. So again, so to make treatment decisions, providers really need to see this data in real time at the visit or if patients are calling in about trouble with their glucoses. Like I mentioned, it's, you know, you have to know where to get the data and sometimes patients have to be involved in the uploading process to give you the data and that takes a lot of staff resources to, 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 to do that. So I think the accessing part of this data is still pretty clunky. And then provider education and interpretation of CGM. So I think especially as we're expanding these devices to primary care, 
and hopefully pharmacists and others that are interested in kind of giving feedback to patients and using these devices. To get the most out of it, I think the providers need to feel confident with how to interpret it. And you know, some of these reports can be 30 pages long. So how do you navigate through all the data? Play so give you, you know, and the initial AGP is a good place to start. Um, but we need to make sure that our providers have education on how to use these devices. And then feedback on the data. So I think this is something that our clinic is pretty um, frustrated with or struggles with because often patients will see us and have data, but then they'll they'll want to have their data reviewed in between visits. And we're not, we don't have an established way to interact with patients outside of the visit to give feedback on their data, which at times is very warranted. So I think um, right now it's really on our own time. And I think my colleagues would argue and our staff uh, that this is invisible work and it's leading to a lot of burnout. So I think the model of care needs to be adjusted so that the care team can be expanded to give feedback um, between the patient with diabetes and their sort of integrated care team. I wanted to just point out a few disparities that I came across with this, preparing for this talk and what I've noted in clinic that I think is important to not ignore. But, um, you know, this was a study looking at a pediatric population with type one diabetes in Texas and 40% um, were on pump, 18% only were on CGM. This was in 2018, so kind of disappointingly low. They saw higher rates of technology use in patients that were non-Hispanic white, who had private insurance and primary English speaking parents. So that was you know, disappointing to see um, some of those statistics. This was a, looking at racial and ethnic disparities in technology, a retrospective review of adult patients with type one diabetes at an urban safety net hospital back in 2016, 2017, so a little bit of an uh, older study at this point, but 30% were using CGM, 26% were using pumps. They saw that anyone on te diabetes technology had a lower A1C compared to patients that were not using diabetes technology. Uh, but disappointingly, there was uh, use in non-white patients was much lower than white patients. And when they looked at black patients, the odds ratio to use technology was 0.25. Um, and even when they adjusted for socioeconomic factors, like high, highest household income level greater than 75,000, Black and Hispanic patients were significantly less likely than white individuals to use diabetes technology. And then finally, this was looking at a Latinx youth population with type two, or sorry, type one diabetes. And this group was more likely to have public insurance. There was less CGM use in this population. And I, I was sort of disappointed and um, concerned to see this other finding of more negative attitudes about diabetes technology. So that brings me on, you know, what can we do at the clinic level and maybe institutional level? So how do we reach all populations to not further widen all these existing disparities we have in our healthcare system to get access to diabetes technology get appropriate education and patient-centered care for a very complicated chronic disease. And, you know, I think there's clearly problems that need to be addressed at the national state public health level um, regarding some of these uh, disparities, but I'm trying to focus on ways that could help our clinic or UW in general uh, do better with implementing this technology. So this is, the model that I've seen a lot and makes sense to me in terms of what the goal is, this ICC framework where you're identifying the right technology, the right person, the right time. Unfortunately, I would still argue the right insurance is still a very relevant topic here. Then you're configuring the device based on what the patient wants, what the treatment's asking for, and getting ongoing support with your staff on using the technology. Uh, and then collaboration. So using the data to drive some of the conversations, making shared decision-making with the patient and having a care team that's integrated so that it's not just the prescribing provider that's trying to manage this in and out of visits. 
And I wanted to specifically talk about access, thinking about primary care, because I know this is an area of interest in, with our primary care colleagues. So as I've mentioned, you know, I think endocrine is the tip of the iceberg for diabetes management and primary care man providers are managing the majority of diabetes, especially type two diabetes. And as I've described, it's, you know, this technology is expanding to the type two diabetes population. Um, one, one awesome team that I've come into contact with with our diabetes uh, technology task force is some of the primary care pharmacists, um, Julie Cable and Lauren Schleicher, to name a few um, of their awesome team. But they are already making this easier in terms of accessing the technology for the primary care clinics. And so they have made sort of a prompt and epic for anyone in primary care. I think they're doing a pilot program first, but basically there will be a prompt available to work through some basic screening questions about the patient's insurance, the indications for getting a CGM, and like what if there's a preference for what type of CGM they want. And that will go to the prior auth team to, is the initial step to help you see if it's a pharmacy benefit versus a durable medical equipment benefit, which kind of has different processes for getting the device for a patient. And then they've also created a CGM order set, which will basically be how you should go in and order the, these devices because each brand has very um, different components that you have to have for each of the uh, CGM brands. So this will make it much more easy. So you don't have to remember like how many sensors per month for this brand versus that brand. And then for staff and training on how to manage the technology, I just wanted to mention, I think, you know, some of the disparities I brought up made me a little concerned about that we need more comprehensive diabetes education in multiple languages at an appropriate health literacy level. We need more bilingual providers. Um, I think it would be lovely to have a social worker assigned in the diabetes clinic to help overcome disparities that we've discussed about. And I wanted to just mention this reference or this resource from Dr. Ann Peter. She's a renowned diabetologist out of USC. Her team made this simple language guides for insulin pumps, pens, and CGMs. And it's in Spanish and English. They did a lot of focus groups to find that like patients liked this sort of bubble um, format where you're kind of getting patient perspectives and things that maybe patients wouldn't feel comfortable to bring up, but are concerned about. So like this last bubble, I like the pen because I do not want my coworkers to know I have diabetes. No one notices my pen. It does not have to be refrigerated and it's easy to carry. I can also inject through my clothes if I have to. So it, it these guides are meant to be comprehensive still, so they don't try to dumb down the, the discussion, but they're trying to be culturally and reading level appropriate to um, kind of give people more comprehensive education and maybe reduce some of these negative attitudes about technology. So this is just uh, another list of all the different guides that the, their group has available. And there's also guides for actual instructors and how, how to use these too. And then just to you know, kind of wrap things up, this is an area that I've thought about a lot and I think would be a huge step in the right direction if we can do this at UW someday. But this is sort of how do we get better access to the data? So I think this is the ideal, it might be a few years down the road. But as you can see on the bottom left is the patient with diabetes. They already are interacting with their smartphone in that A back and forth arrow and their app on the phone with their data. Right now that's already automatically going to the device cloud. So um, that's a passive process that just sits in the, the data sits in the cloud. But right now we don't have a way for that cloud data to get into Epic. And that's what's I think needed is integration in automatically into our EHR. So there are companies that can help integrate this, where then once it's integrated on the front end, the provider, whenever they wanna see the data, they basically just enter in an order. So it would be an AGP report order or a CGM metric order that would go directly to the flow sheet. And again, this would be, the patient would sign up initially, but then it would not be dependent on the patient uploading anything. So it's sort of passive. And then the healthcare provider would hopefully have a closed loop feedback system where they could then uh, interact with the patient to give recs and make changes. So this has been done. This was presented at the ABA conference last year. The, a group out of Park Nicolay um, was able to do this with Freestyle Libre. So you can see on the left, 
that's the AGP report that just pulls in when you type in the order. And then when you type in the metrics, it pulls into the flow sheet. So you can see you could easily copy and paste a trend into your note to compare. And then finally, the feedback point. I hope I've convinced you that patients do better with frequent follow-up uh, to reach their glycemic targets. And that right now our care delivery system where you're seeing like your MD, APP, you know, every six months is not really sufficient for this type of disease process. And we need to move to more of a team-based care, especially for patients that are not at their glycemic goal. So, you know, I think this idea of frequent check-ins using a closed feedback loop and expanding the team to include pharmacists, educators, coaches, um, is, is how it has a lot of appeal. So Cleveland Clinic is doing this. They have a remote monitoring program where they're enrolling higher risk patients and their criteria is an A1C over nine, recent hospitalization for diabetes. They're in a three month intensive program where they basically have hired these coaches that have background in motivational interviewing or often are um, dietitians. They're like the frontline people to review the data kind of encourage the patient, give education, and then they have a system to escalate it to the pharmacist and then MD or APP. And I think it provides more touch points to make these changes in between the formal visits to get to the glycemic goal faster. And I think it's letting people work sort of to the top of their license in a better way. So just in conclusion, so technology can improve diabetes outcomes and quality of life for patients. I think there's still too many barriers for access and acceptance of the technology, especially in some populations. We need to streamline the integration of the data into the EHR, better reimbursement support so that we're not doing all this invisible work and new models of care that include like a wider team. And in general, I think chronic disease management needs more advocacy in our very pay for procedure healthcare system. So with that, um, I have a few minutes, I hope, to you know, open it up. And that's all I have. Thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you so much for a wonderful overview. It's um, really impressive how far the technology has advanced, but yet our, our care models have not kept up with the advances in technology. Um, maybe you can stop sharing your screen. Okay. Uh, and we have time for just a couple of questions. One is uh, more of a basic how-to for those of us uh, who don't uh, aren't as familiar with the technologies on the ambulatory side. What is, how do you place the monitor? Is it an invasive procedure? Does a patient do it? Can you do it anywhere? Are there risk of infections? From a practical standpoint, I got a monitor. What do I do with it? Yeah, great question. Yeah, so it's it's usually they've been getting easier and easier to place. The patient can do it on their own. There's usually sort of like a applicator that helps to use a, a little needle to guide the catheter to the right place. It's just in the subcutaneous tissue. So anywhere I usually tell patients like for the different brands sometimes we want you to put it in certain places, but it's really like anywhere you can pinch an inch, you can kind of use this area to put a sensor in. Um, but usually it's the abdomen or the back of the arm that people will wear the sensors in. Is it a barrier for people who are active, like if you're a baseball pitcher or, I don't know, a football player or something like that, uh, do you risk dislodging the monitor? I think that's some, you know, some patients have concerns about that. There's, they're definitely getting better, less bulky, um, more like low profile for the sensors that have come out. And there are ways, especially with some adhesive um, applications on top that allow really active patients to use them. And I would say most athletes, like, like these, um, cause they can get immediate data, like to their smartwatch or, you know, things like that. You can shower with it. I mean, you can, you just wear it for somewhere between a week and two weeks, depending on the brand, and then you can change it. So sometimes they wear off too soon and patients get frustrated with that. If they have to call the company to like get it early or, you know, if it falls off, but that's not super common. Okay. Um, and then where do you see the application of uh, CGM in the nursing home population where the patient isn't uh, monitoring or managing their own blood glucoses? Yeah, and I think that almost that gets almost to like that inpatient discussion where, you know, okay. CGM and the inpatient yeah. discussion. So it's almost, I think, I think we, I, I definitely have patients, especially like a freestyle Libre, which um, is an intermittently scanned version. So the patient doesn't really see the data until someone scans it. 
So I feel like that especially could be helpful in a nursing home where like the staff would just scan it before each meal, for example, but it would also beep at them if they were low to know that someone should intervene sooner. Um, but I think the question would just be like, who's looking at the data and monitoring it and understanding like, you can't just keep giving, in, you still have to respect the pharmacokinetics of insulin. You can't just, you know, stack the doses if you, if it's not coming down within one hour of when you just last gave a correction dose, for example. So I definitely think there's a place for it. And I have some uh, nursing home patients using devices, uh, which is it's often helpful. Well, we are just at the hour. So I want to thank you for the wonderful overview. Um, and uh, uh, really um, the insight into how it's potentially impacting um, healthcare equity um, and access to care and um, current barriers for integration, I think is really important. And I have um, a lot of faith that with uh, outstanding investigators like yourself tackling these problems, we'll be able to um, make significant progress. So thank you all. Thanks There's so sun outside. Hopefully the, the snow will be melting. Um, and um, thank you all for your attention. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.